What's up, guys? Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Bontai Network podcast. I'm coming to you now from ASAN in the workshop. You can see we've got the Tokonoma behind me here. We've got a really nice ponderosa pine set up in the Tokonoma with a beautiful scroll by a fellow from China who's now making scrolls exclusively for ASAN. So we're going to be putting these scrolls on our website next year up for sale, but I just wanted to show you guys the, uh, the Tokonoma here and our new setup. So for those of you who are just listening to this through SoundCloud or Stitcher or Apple iTunes, uh, if you want to actually see the video and see the tree behind me as I talk, you can go to our YouTube channel, just search ASAN Bonsai on YouTube and it will pull that up. So today I wanna to kind of give you guys an overview of what's been going on here at ASAN over the last few months. Uh, again, the last real podcast that I did was with Rafa just about a month ago or a couple weeks ago, I guess. Uh, but before that, the last podcast I did was last December. So it had been, I guess, about 10 months since the previous podcast and a lot of stuff has happened here at ASAN during that period. So I wanna fill you guys in on what exactly has been going on. So first and foremost, Nancy and I, we were in Japan in January January and February. We always go back. I help Fujikawa-san out at the nursery at Kokan uh, with the trees that we're making or he's making for the Kokofu, uh, in particular the uh, sales area at the Kokofu. So I spent a few days helping him out with that. Also took a little bit of a vacation. So I posted a vlog about it. You can go check it out on YouTube as well. Uh, we went to Miyajima and did a sort of deep dive into the trees on Miyajima and the history and influence of Shintoism on bonsai. It's actually one of my favorite videos that I've ever put together. So definitely check that out. I'll uh, try to remember to put a link in the description down below on YouTube here so you can click right on that and go to it. Now, while we were in Japan, we had a tour that we hosted. We always, my wife and I always do a tour for the Kokofu, which is usually from about February 5th through the 15th, somewhere kind of right around that range. We almost always start down in Kyoto, then we go to Osaka, and then work our way up to Tokyo at the end. Well, this year we had the biggest group of people that we've ever had on one of our tours. We had 30 people total. So they were coming from, I believe, eight countries around the world. So it was a really interesting and nice representation of the bonsai community all over the globe. But we all flew in, met in Japan. Nancy and I picked everybody up at the airport, and then we took everybody, of course, around Japan. Well, on the second day of the tour, we had just finished the day. My wife and I were going out with one of her friends in Kyoto for dinner that night. Uh, it was actually her former boss. Nancy used to work on a street called Pontocho, which is one of the last three or four remaining geisha districts in all of Kyoto. So it actually runs right along the Kamogawa River. So for those of you who are into Suiseki, you'll probably recognize that term, Kamogawa. That's one of the most famous rivers in Japan for collecting su Suiseki out of. Uh, so a lot of the stones that come out of that river are just pitch black, beautiful stones. It's a little difficult to find nice stones in that river nowadays because a lot of the best ones or most of the best ones have been picked over over the last few centuries. But in any case, this street, Pontocho, runs right alongside the Kamogawa and Nancy's former boss, uh, we call her Mama-san, she owned a restaurant slash bar right on the Kamogawa. So you walk down Pontocho, it's got sort of a really old school Kyoto kind of feel to it. Uh, and then on one side is the Kamogawa and then on the other side is a street called Kiyamachi. So Pontocho is kind of sandwiched right in between. It's a very, very narrow street. If you've ever walked down the street, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, but it's actually almost difficult to pass somebody walking down that street because it's so narrow. But it's got a really, really old school feel to it. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's been a sort of petition over the last few years to get the restaurant owners along that street to take down their bright signs and put up more traditional signs. It's been kind of a hard push to get people to agree to it because obviously the bigger the brighter the sign, the more likely people are going to come into the restaurant. So it still does have a somewhat of a modern feel in that regard. But the rest of the street, it's kind of cobblestone almost on the, uh, the pathway itself. And then the front sides of all the buildings are yakisugi, which we've talked about in the past. It's that burned cedar siding. So it's got a really, really cool effect. Uh, and then right out in front of a lot of the buildings, there are uh, sort of curved bamboo uh, pieces that kind of hang out into the street that are designed to keep, I think, cats away from the sides of the buildings. Uh, and it just gives it a really interesting look uh, on that particular street. But in any case, we were out with Mama-san that night on the second night of the tour. It was about 6.30, 7 o'clock. She took us to a really nice restaurant that was owned by one of her friends uh, in Kyoto. And about halfway through dinner, my stomach started hurting really, really, really badly. And I thought, you know, maybe it's just some issue, something I ate during the day. I had actually had uh, fried kaki, which uh, kaki is, uh, what is that? Uh, 
oysters, I guess. I had fried oysters earlier in the day and I thought, oh, maybe, you know, I, I caught something from that. So I kept getting up and going to the bathroom and went several times, you know, couldn't, couldn't get rid of the pain. So went back to our room that night in the apartment that we were renting for that month in Kyoto. And by about two o'clock in the morning, I was still rolling around, hadn't slept at all. The pain was getting worse and worse and worse. So Nancy convinced me to go to the hospital. So went downstairs, hopped in a taxi, rode about 10 minutes over to the nearest hospital. And uh, it turned out that I had appendicitis, acute appendicitis. So by 5 a.m. they had me in surgery and were taking my appendix out. So that was a major, major ordeal. Now, one thing that really freaked me out at the time was that Nancy and I, we usually don't travel with traveler's insurance. Now, of course, we've got insurance here in the States, but we didn't have traveler's insurance on this particular trip. So I get to the hospital and the doctor said, well, we got to do some tests on you, but they're going to be very, very expensive because you don't have insurance. I said, okay, well, how much is it going to cost? And he said, $150. And I thought, okay, you can run as many tests as you want on me. It's not a problem at all. Because those same tests in the States, if you had no insurance or even with insurance, it would have been hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars just to run the tests. So I ran the test, found out that I had acute appendicitis, and then decided that I needed to go into surgery. But before I went into surgery, he said, again, it's going to cost you a lot of money because you have no insurance. I said, okay, well, how much? He said, well, it's going to be about uh, $2,500. I thought, wow, that's amazing. In the States, I pay a ridiculous amount of money every month because I'm a sole proprietor here. I pay a lot of money every month for insurance and then I have what's called a, a high deductible. So I have l relatively low monthly payment compared to a lot of people. It's still hundreds and hundreds of dollars, but then I have a high deductible because I'm relatively young, don't have a lot of health issues, knock on wood. So with that high deductible, if I had had the appendix taken out here, it would have cost me about two and a half times that amount, even with insurance. So as bad as it was to have appendicitis in the middle of our tour with 30 people in Japan, it turned out to be somewhat of a blessing in disguise because it was a lot cheaper. So. Everybody on the tour was really cool about it. Uh, Nancy actually came to the hospital uh, right before I had surgery. She had to sign some paperwork. So she got there at about 4.30 in the morning, didn't sleep at all that night, woke up the next day and ran the tour by herself with those 30 people on the tour. And all of them were fantastic. They knew that uh, I was in sort of a serious situation and that uh, you know Nancy was the only one running the tour. So they were really cool about sort of helping her out, helping her carry things. Uh, helping uh, you know make sure that everybody was sort of on time when they needed to be back in the bus and so on and so forth so uh, she ran the tour that day around Kyoto then the following day she had to take everybody up to Tokyo all by herself so it's relatively easy to get everybody on the bullet train just a couple minute walk from the hotel in Kyoto you hop on the bullet train and then head straight up to Tokyo it's like a two and a half three hour ride something like that the problem is when you get to Tokyo station it is ridiculously full of people. I believe that the Tokyo Metro line runs like a million people every 30 seconds or something. It moves that many people every 30 seconds. So a, there's a tremendous amount of people who are in Tokyo Station in particular. So she had to navigate the entire group of 30 people through Tokyo Station and get them over to the hotel. But luckily, she didn't lose anybody. Everybody made it A-OK. -okay. So, uh, you know, it turned out to be a good thing and somewhat of a blessing in disguise. So uh, that was, you know, kind of the beginning of the year. Um, and then when we got back from Japan, uh, I almost immediately started our courses here again at ASA. And we're running uh, intensive courses where students come in three times a year. Each time they come, they stay for three days. So this previous year, 2019 we had five groups three groups were focused on conifers and two groups were focused on broadleaf trees so broadleaf evergreens like olives for example and deciduous material like maples so we had those five groups coming in uh, three times this year for three days each time so as soon as we got back from Japan uh, literally that next weekend uh, we had the first session as a matter of fact I forgot about this when we got to the airport in Tokyo to fly back to the States the people at the counter saw me kind of limping up to the front. They asked me, well, what's wrong? I said, well, I just had my appendix taken out about uh, four days ago, five days ago. And they said, oh, well, do you have a note from the doctor? Uh, because we can't let you on the plane if you don't have a note from the doctor. So I said, well, no, I don't have a note from the doctor. I'm totally fine. 
Uh, and they said, well, you know, it's been less than two weeks since your surgery, so we have to have a note from the doctor. So I immediately called the hospital down in Kyoto to try to get a hold of the doctor. And of course, he was busy in surgery. And, you know, when you get to the airport, you're only maybe two and a half, three hours early at the most. So you got a very short window of time. So some of those surgeries can take four, five, six hours. So we had no idea when the doctor was going to get out of surgery to give a call back to the people at the desk there and let them actually let me on the plane. So we kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and finally he called back, but we had already missed the flight. So the problem was two days later, I was supposed to have the very first session for the school, for our intensive classes here at ASAM. So I, you know, there was no way I was going to be able to make it back in time. So I immediately emailed all the people who were supposed to come uh, for that first session. And it turns out a couple of them had already loaded up their cars and were within a couple of hours of heading down to Nashville because some of the guys are driving 12 hours. So they leave a couple of days early. So luckily I caught everybody right before they left. They were able to change the hotel reservations and then we rescheduled for later in the spring. So it was just one thing after another right there at the beginning of the year. But once we got back to the States, everything started going pretty smoothly. So we started running the courses. Of course, this spring was the first spring here at ASAN, so it was just balls to the wall, busy, repotting all the trees that were in wooden boxes that had been collected out of the mountains over the last few years. This was the first spring we were able to take those and transition them into actual pots. So these, we spent the entire spring doing that from sunup till sundown. Uh, with the intensive group, we were able to repot some of the giant trees here at ASAN, but we had a lot of fun doing that this spring. It was a lot of work, but we didn't lose anything uh, from repotting the spring. Everything transitioned beautifully, and we've been developing that material over the last six, seven months now since the spring. Uh, the goal with the intensive classes was to sort of teach the process of taking raw, raw material, raw yamadori, repotting it, uh, building up the strength and the health over a growing season, and the trees that transitioned well in the fall start uh, providing big bends or putting big bends into the trunks, into the branches, or doing you know sort of initial uh, structural work on those trees. And uh, that's what we're getting ready to do actually right now. We've got the intensive classes starting up again in the fall right now, and we're going to be working on making major bends and setting that strength structure uh, of a lot of those trees that we potted up in the spring. So really, really looking forward to getting into that shortly here. Now for the meat and potatoes of this particular episode of the Bonsai Network podcast, I thought we'd get into some of the emails that I've been receiving over the last 10 or 11 months since the last real podcast. Uh, I've actually been in contact with somebody in the interim, a uh, fellow named Luis Hurtado. Uh, he's been working on a degree, a university degree, uh, doing research work on the differences between Japanese bonsai and uh, Western bonsai, uh, or bonsai in the States uh, and in Europe as well. Um, in particular, he said that he's working on the differences between the aesthetics of Western bonsai and Japanese bonsai. And in April this year, I actually uh, had a back and forth with him via email. And he you know, applied that information to his uh, degree research. Uh, but he sent me a follow-up email just a couple of weeks ago. And I thought that the questions that he asked in this particular email were really good questions to use in the podcast uh, as a podcast episode. So for the meat and potatoes of this episode, we're going to jump into his particular email here and his questions. So his first question is, uh, do you think there is a difference between the Japanese aesthetics of bonsai and the Western aesthetics of bonsai? Uh, I've talked about this, I think, in previous episodes before, uh, at least to some degree, but we can dive in a little bit deeper here. So uh, I definitely think that there are, of course, some differences. Uh, but what I see right now is that a lot of the sort of uh, boom in Western bonsai, and particularly in the United States and in Europe as well, uh, but particularly in the United States, uh, it has come about from folks actually going to Japan doing apprenticeships, learning about bonsai in Japan, and then coming back and applying those same techniques to uh, American native material here. So the aesthetics in terms of how the trees are actually designed and created by those people who have studied in Japan, like myself, for example, uh, like Michael Hagedorn, for example, Matt Reel, Tyler Sherrod, guys like that. Uh, the difference in aesthetic between what we learned in Japan and what we apply to the trees here, there's really no difference. The way a juniper grows in the States is the same way a juniper grows in Japan. The way a pine grows 
grows in the States the same way a pine grows in Japan. Now, we do have a broader landscape here. We do have, say, uh, deserts, which Japan doesn't really have. Um, but in terms of latitude and elevation, we have the same general range as Japan. Japan's very long from north to south, so its latitudinal range is very long. And the elevational range of Japan stretches up to the tree line, just like it does in the United States. So those two elements are what really affect uh, climate, and that's what really affects uh, the growth habits of trees. So you can find very similar looking trees in Japan in the mountains. Say, for example, a Japanese white pine. If you look at those trees, they're high elevation trees. Uh, a lot of them grow up near the Fukushima area, which was the area that was affected by the tsunami back in 2011. Uh, they grow in that area, but at high elevations. If you look in the States, out in places like Wyoming, for example, at similar elevations, you'll find something called the limber pine, which looks almost identical to a Japanese white pine. It's a five needle pine. It's got nice, short, tight needles on it. Uh, it produces dead wood, similar bark structure, similar movement in the trunk lines. Uh, so you can find you know, parallels there. Same thing with the junipers. If you look at, uh, say, Itoigawa, for example, in Japan, Junipers chinensis uh, variety Itoigawa, which comes from the Niigata uh, area of Japan. Uh, particularly, the best trees are collected off of a mountain called Kurohime, which translates to Black Princess, which is a pretty cool name, I think, for uh, a mountain. Uh, but a lot of the best Itoigawa were collected uh, off of that mountainside. And as a matter of fact, I think it's illegal to collect on that particular mountain uh, anymore. It was over-collected back in the day. Um, but if you look at the Itoigawa that are collected there, at least in terms of the uh, trunk movement and the striations in the deadwood, you can find similar trees in the States like the Rocky Mountain Junipers at similar elevations. Now, of course, the foliage type is slightly different, but the characteristics of the deadwood, the movement in the trunk, all of that is nearly identical. So there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, so that's not necessarily what, uh, you know, has influenced bonsai in Japan or influenced bonsai in the States. Um, but the way that bonsai is done in Japan and those folks like myself who've gone to Japan and studied there, we're applying the same aesthetic uh, principles to the material that's native here in the States. So it seems like there's uh, kind of a, a move in that direction in the States. Um, what I would say too is that uh, maybe this, the difference right now, uh, at this particular moment, and this may change going forward, uh, but the difference aesthetically right now in the States is there seems to be a push uh, for using pots in the States that uh, are a bit louder, uh, more gauche, uh, more in your face, uh, more texturized, more colorful than the pots that are utilized in Japan where craftsmanship is sort of the, the main focus. Uh, in Japan, in the States, it's more about um, sort of imbuing your own ego into the work of art and that goes for potters as well. You know, taking uh, their ideas, throwing them into the pot, not really thinking so much about how it's gonna meld with the tree later, but making the pot as cool or as awesome as possible on its own. Uh, for me, it's a little bit too loud in a lot of instances. Uh, it sort of detracts from the tree. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at potters in Japan, for example, like, uh, you know, Gyozan or uh, Shuzan or, uh, you know, any of the potters in Tokoname, Yamaaki, guys like that, the way that the pots are built, uh, there's a focus more on the craftsmanship of the pot, the lines of the pot, clean lines, you know, finding the best possible clay to build the pot out of that doesn't have that rough texture to it. Uh, you know, if they make glazes, the glazes tend to be a bit more subdued uh, and they tend to match the trees a bit better. And that's not to say that there aren't loud pots in Japan. Uh, there are, but they're only used in certain contexts with certain trees where right now in the States, it seems like those loud pots are utilized with everything. Uh, particularly texturized pots. That seems to be a, a really popular thing right now. Um, so for me, that's not, uh, not my personal preference aesthetically, but there's nothing wrong with it. So, uh, you know, that, that difference right there, I think is one of the, the biggest differences uh, between the West and Japan. And that is the idea of, you know, the individual versus the community. So in the States uh, and in, uh, well, in Europe uh, in particular, but in the, in the United States more specifically, uh, you know, it's a very individualistic society. We talked about this, I think, in one of the first or second episodes of the podcast um, about Hofstede's cultural dimensions as a fellow named Geert Hofstede, a social scientist who uh, built a framework for measuring national culture. And one of those elements that his framework measures is the difference in individualism versus sort of uh, community. So in the States and in Europe, it's very, very individualistic. Uh, you know, like I said, when you're building a work of art, it's about putting your own personal flavor uh, into that art. Your own ego is imbued in that uh, work of art. Whereas in Japan, 
it's much more sort of community based. So aesthetics in Japan tend to be uh, sort of socially derived, I guess would be the best way to say it, uh, meaning that there's sort of a social consensus about what is beautiful, what is good taste, what is aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and that aesthetic tends towards uh, uh, subtlety. It tends towards uh, subdued colors uh, to natural textures. Uh, to you know, soft lines, uh, things along those lines. Um, whereas again, in the states, it's a much louder thing. It's a representation of you as an artist. So uh, you know, the the phrase "beauty is in the eye of the beholder" doesn't really exist in Japan. It's a very Western and particularly a very American uh, approach to aesthetics. Now, one of th of my recommendations for you guys to check out, and I've mentioned this in a, in previous episodes of the podcast as well, is a book by Donald Ritchie. Uh, it's called A Tractate on Japanese Aesthetics. It's only like 60 pages long. It's a very, very short book. Uh, but to me, in my opinion, uh, it's the best distillation of Japanese aesthetic principles, you know, sort of consolidated down into a tiny, easy, easily readable and digestible format. You could easily read that book in an hour, hour and a half. Um, but I think the main takeaway for me in that book uh, was uh, or is the idea that in the West, it's about, again, imbuing your own personal ego into the artwork, and it doesn't really matter what other people think, eyes in the, or beauty is in the eye of the beholder, uh, whereas in Japan, it's more about the process to get to that final product than it is about the final product itself. Uh, so, you know, for example, when you're building a deciduous piece of material, if the goal is, if you've identified the goal as being creating a, you know, very soft, elegant branch pattern on a tree, uh, say, for example, a trident maple, you want to create that nice soft silhouette on the tree, nice ramification. But there are certain techniques that have to be performed very specifically at certain times of the year, year after year after year, to reach that end goal. If those techniques aren't performed or if they're skipped you know, every other year or done every three years, you're never going to get to that final goal. Same thing with lacquerware, for example. Uh, you know, if you're painting on a certain number of coats on a, a bowl, a lacquerware bowl, if you miss one of those coats or if you add too many coats, it's gonna have too little or too much sheen to it. So it's the actual steps in the process that get you that final product. And that's sort of, uh, to me, the main principle uh, and the main difference between Western aesthetics and Japanese aesthetics. Okay, so the second question from Lewis here is, uh, in your opinion, what is most valued in a bonsai in Europe uh, or in the US uh, and in bonsai in Japan? Um, so what I would say, maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about a very specific uh, phrase in Japanese. Uh, we've actually been covering this recently in our intensive classes here, in our second year intensive uh, classes here at ASAN. Um, and it's a term in Japanese called mochikomi. Uh, it's not a term that you really hear very often uh, outside of the bonsai community, although it, it does apply in other contexts as well. Um, but it's very sort of specific to bonsai and means a very specific thing. And it's a little difficult to describe, so I'm going to try to break it down for you here. Uh, so mochi of the mochikomi in this context means to carry. Uh, it's a conjugation of the verb motsu, to carry. Uh, and then komi in this case is uh, translated sort of as into or inside. So you could kind of translate mochikomi to, uh, to carry inside. Uh, but it's, you know, literal translation doesn't really mean that much. It doesn't really have that much uh, meaning in terms of what we're talking about here. When we say mochikomi as it relates to bonsai specifically, what it refers to is when you look at a tree that uh, has been a bonsai for a very long time or that appears to have been a bonsai for a very long time, it appears to, it appears to meld together with the pot that it's in. It appears to sort of belong in that position. All the branches are sort of in the right spot. They look refined uh, but very natural, for example. Uh, that tree is said to have mochikomi. It's sort of a feeling that you get looking at the tree that everything is right. Not necessarily overly refined, not you know every little detail of the tree wired out, every little branch placed in just the right spot, but an overall feeling in that tree that uh, sort of you know gives you uh, that sense that the tree sort of belongs where it is. Uh, I would say one of the best examples of this, and you can look this up online, is a tree called Higurashi. H-I-G-U-R-A-S-H-I, -I, I believe I spelled that correctly. Uh, it's a Japanese white pine that's actually uh, on display at the Omiya Bonsai Museum in Saitama. 
Uh, it's you know right next to the Omiya Bonsai village there, or part of the village. Uh, that tree was donated, I believe it was part of the Takagi collection, uh, which is a privately owned collection on a rooftop in Tokyo. Um, I think it was either at somebody's penthouse apartment or at their uh, business. It was Mr. Takagi was the owner. Uh, but when he passed away, he donated his collection. Uh, which ended up at the Omiya Bonsai Museum. Uh, so that particular tree, Higurashi, is a Japanese white pine dr double trunk tree. Um, it can actually be displayed from either side. Uh, both sides are really, really interesting. Um, but when you look at that tree, you can tell that that tree has been wired and unwired dozens and dozens of times. As a matter of fact, I think it was collected prior to World War II. Uh, so it's been a bonsai for a long time and it was already old when it was collected. It was probably at least 150, 200 years old when it was collected. Uh, and you know, you add another 60, 70, 80, 90 years on it. I don't know exactly when it was collected, but I think it was pre-World War II. And you've got a very old tree that's been in a pot for a very long time. So that tree to me, uh, is sort of the embodiment of that idea of mochikomi. Um, there are lots of other trees that you'll see in Japan that sort of have that feeling to, that, to them. Uh, and there are also certain artists in Japan uh, that are better able to sort of imbue trees with that sense of mochikomi aesthetically uh, than other artists. So my, one of my favorite examples is Shinji Suzuki, uh, who is based out of Obuse, which is near Nagano, Japan. Um, if you look at the way that he designs trees, uh, there's just something about the tree that makes it look like it has that feeling of mochikomi, like the, the branches belong in those places. There's a natural but refined elegance to the tree. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's difficult to mimic his style. It's almost impossible. Uh, Michael Hagedorn, uh, for example, up in Portland, Oregon, he studied under Shinji Suzuki. Uh, he's one of the few people I've ever known or ever seen, you know, be able to sort of take that same aesthetic and apply it to American material uh, here in the United States uh, to great success. So if you go check out his blog, I think it's crategus.com. I just look, look up uh, Michael Hagedorn Bonsai online and you'll see some of his work. Uh, but there's just something quiet, soft, you know, uh, right about those trees that gives a sense of that sort of mochikomi. So um, I would say that that is probably one of the most valued things in the Japanese context. Uh, whereas in the States, I don't think, and in Europe as well, I, I think that there's, uh, in certain circles, uh, there's more uh, emphasis on overly refined trees, maybe the best way to say it. So trees that, um, sort of look like the trees in Japan back in the early to mid, even into the late 1980s. And we've talked about this before. Uh, there was, that period was the bubble period in Japan, the economic bubble period. So there was uh, a big push for trying to differentiate one's product from another, pro uh, another nursery's product to try to sell your product uh, faster because there was a, a lot of excess money or extra money, uh, disposable income that was available for people to spend that money on art and hobbies like bonsai. So these different nurseries were trying to differentiate their products. One of the ways they did that was by starting to detail why are the trees at that point. So if you look back at the Kokofu books from really the early to mid 1980s in particular, uh, the trees are over, almost overly refined, very, very detailed, very flat bottom pads, for example. As a matter of fact, if you look back at some of my work uh, at Kokan during my apprenticeship, from early on in my apprenticeship, say the first, second, third, maybe even into the fourth year, um, th uh, there were a lot of trees that I styled that were sort of in that style. And Fujikawa-san kind of prefers uh, that style, very, very flat bottom pads, almost overly refined. So there seems to be um, a draw towards that aesthetic right now in the States. Uh, almost like the 1980s in Japan, uh, where people seem to like that overly refined look. And that's not everybody. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't like that. Um, and I've sort of shifted away from that a little bit myself. Uh, and that's not, uh, despite what some people think, uh, an influence now being back in the States for a couple of years. Oh, uh, I'm back in the States and now I'm designing trees differently than I did in Japan during my apprenticeship. Uh, it's not like that at all. I always wanted to design the trees in Japan with a little bit more lift to the branches, for example, a little bit softer appearance. But when you're doing an apprenticeship and you're studying under someone, whatever your teacher, whatever your oyakata says, that's what you gotta do. So, like I said, Fujikawa-san really preferred and prefers that flat bottom, uh, overly refined aesthetic. Um, so as an apprentice, you have to do what he says. So now that I'm back in the States, I have a little bit more freedom to kind of branch away from that and do what I like to do. Uh, if you look at the aesthetics of how I design trees, it's a little bit different than it used to be. So, and I, I prefer the sort of more natural, uh, natural but refined kind of look. Now, that's another thing that 
I think a lot of folks uh, in the States and uh, in Europe, for example, particularly in the States though, uh, get confused about when you say, I like a more natural looking tree. It doesn't mean that I don't wire the trees. What it means is I'm looking to create something natural but refined. So moving towards that mochikomi aesthetic uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, so, you know, if you look at higurashi, like I said, the white pine, it's been wired dozens and dozens of times. Now the wire's off the tree, all the branches look like they're in the right spot. They're floating, uh, it looks very natural, but that's all man-made. That's all hand done, uh, with the exception, of course, of the dead wood on that tree, that's all natural. Uh, but the branch placement, the way the foliage looks, that's all uh, created by many, many people over many, many decades. So I'm working sort of towards that here as uh, an aesthetic principle at ASAN, and I think you're seeing a lot of that in the states as well um, but uh, actually this sort of brings us to the next question from uh, Lewis here it sort of ties into it he says do you agree with the statement that Japanese bonsai are more refined and Western bonsai uh, is more ap apparent than refined I think he sort of means natural than refined I only agree in the sense that uh, there isn't an emphasis placed on learning how to wire and style trees properly here in the States. There's an emphasis on trying to create something that looks natural, which usually just means I don't want to wire. I'm too lazy to learn how to wire. I'm too lazy to put the time and effort into wiring. So I'm going to hedge prune. I'm going to let it grow. I might clip back a couple things here and there. I'm just going to, you know, sort of clip and grow uh, or use that as a technique for designing trees. Uh, and I think you end up with, you know, major problems in the long run. So there's some actually relatively famous guys in Europe who use the hedge trimming technique. Uh, and they claim that, oh, you know, you, so you, if I do this, people complain about it, but when they see my trees, they're like, oh, they're so beautiful. The problem is you're not looking at the details. Uh, you know, if you hedge prune a Japanese maple or trident maple, and by hedge prune, I mean taking big old shears, hacking it back, or taking even an electric shear and trimming it back to shape, yeah, the silhouette might look fine, but in the winter, when you go and look at the details in the branches, and you compare that, if you put it side by side with, say, a trident maple or a Japanese maple that's been properly pruned, every little bud has been pinched properly, defoliation's been done in the proper way, you can notice a massive difference between the two when they're side by side. If there's no comparison and you're happy with that, that's fine, but don't call that natural bonsai. I just call it lazy bonsai. Uh, and I know that might piss a few people off, but really don't care, it's my opinion here. Uh, so, you know, I think that if you really wanna create bonsai at the absolute highest level and you're focused on quality and on content, uh, I think that, you know, learning those techniques and applying them year after year after year, understanding the process will get you closer to that sense of mochikomi uh, that is a preferred Japanese aesthetic uh, than you'll get by hedge pruning or, you know, trying to create something natural right from the get-go. It's very difficult to do, if not impossible, and I think uh, it's, it's sort of a lazy approach to bonsai. All right, so on to the next question from Lewis here. Uh, he says, do you think Westerners prefer conifers to deciduous trees? Uh, I think right now that seems to be the case. Uh, I think it's mainly uh, because the turnaround time for coniferous material is so much faster in terms of developing it uh, than with working with deciduous trees. So, you know, for example, we have some trees here at the nursery at ASAN that have only been out of the mountains for two and a half years or so, and they're already almost at a stage where they can go in an exhibition. We probably need one or two more growing seasons uh, before they're actually ready to put on display. Um, but, you know, you're looking at anywhere from from say three to six years, if you know what you're doing, taking a raw piece of material from the mountains to an exhibition. Whereas if you're working with deciduous material, it's much more long-term oriented. You're looking at, you know, to create something ideal, uh, and I've talked about what I think are sort of ideal characteristics of deciduous material in the past, in past episodes, so you can go back and listen to that. Uh, but to create something ideal, you know, if you're taking an air layer, for example, which is a really good way to start deciduous material, you're looking at 15, 15 years minimum, uh, typically more like 25 to 35 years to really get something you know fully developed that looks as good as its coniferous counterparts, which you've developed in you know four to six years. So um, you know the society in in the states uh, and in Europe tends to be uh, very short term oriented, whereas in Japan it's much more long term oriented, um, and you can see this reflected in organizations and businesses uh, and just in society at large. Uh, so again, if you want more detail on that, definitely go back and check out one of our previous episodes uh, of the Bonsai Network podcast where I get into more detail about that.
Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, he says, do you think the art of bonsai is stalling in Japan uh, and the West is evolving towards more trans transgressive styles? Um, I don't think that bonsai as an art is failing in Japan. I just think that the economy has, has been so stagnant for so many years uh, and the market has been so saturated in Japan uh, that you're seeing less and less people invest in bonsai in Japan, either as a hobby or as high art. Uh, and a lot of that material is now being sold overseas where there's more of an interest. So in Europe, for example, those trees can be exported from Japan directly to Europe with very, very little uh, issue, uh, very, very short quarantine times. They don't have to be bare rooted. Same thing into China, same thing into Taiwan, into Korea. Uh, so those areas now that have better economies than Japan does are the ones that are buying up the trees and they're leaving Japan. Uh, the issue too is that the next generation in Japan isn't really taking over the nurseries from their parents. So in the past you would have a line of uh, nurseries where the first nursery uh, or a group of nurseries would be creating material, uh, say from air layers, for example, or from cuttings and field growing them. Then the next nursery will be taking those out, putting the initial styling in them, maybe grafting those, uh, or maybe a separate nursery would be grafting those. Then they'd move on to more of a refinement type nursery and then sort of a high-end finishing nursery that would sell those off as high art. We are not seeing the uh, line in production uh, being taken over by the younger generation. So a lot of those old time nurseries are shutting down or have shut down and there's no no new material of quality that's being developed in Japan. That and, you know, they can't really collect material anymore from the mountains because it's become illegal in most places, uh, makes it very difficult to have a continuing uh, market in Japan for bonsai. Uh, to the second half of the question about, you know, is the West evolving uh, more towards trans transgressive styles? Uh, possibly, but I think uh, there's sort of a misunderstanding about bonsai in Japan in general that leads people to believe when they see something that's created in the West, in the States and in Europe, that looks different from what the, their perceptions are of Japanese bonsai, they think, oh wow, that's a transgressive style that's evolving here in the United States or evolving here in Europe. And that's not necessarily true. There are some weird, weird trees in Japan that are completely acceptable, that are in the Kokofu, that are in the Taikon Ten, that are in the Sakofu Ten. It's not this cookie cutter, you know, informal upright style with the first branch on the outside of the curve on one side, the second branch on the outside of the next curve, the third branch to the back. There's none of that. As a matter of fact, when people come on our tours to Japan, one of the first things that they notice and that they say to me is after they've walked through the Kokofu, I looked up under the trees and I noticed that there were crossing branches, the trunks were crossing, all of those rules that I learned about in the States, none of those seem to apply to the trees here. Exactly. So that type of sort of rule-based approach to bonsai in the States uh, sort of uh, spawned from the uh, sort of Southern California era uh, of bonsai teachers, the sort of first and second generation Japanese who were teaching in that part of the world. Um, you know, and it's not a bad thing. What, what they were doing was taking certain principles and trying to distill them down into a teachable format that would then be digestible by the American community uh, out West. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem is though that uh, in doing so, it became sort of like a, a, the Bible of bonsai. You had to follow these certain principles, otherwise it wasn't creating the most beautiful bonsai. And that's total crap. I mean, like I said, you come to Japan, you see the trees in person, there is no cookie cutter in Japan, particularly at the highest levels. So this idea that there are you know, transgressive styles that are being created in the States, I don't think that's the case at all, or in Europe, I don't think that's the case either. Uh, you know, there may be some semi-unique artists, for example, that are doing some different things, um, but as a general rule of thumb, I think that most people have sort of a misunderstanding of what Japanese bonsai is in the first place, identifying it as cookie cutter when it actually isn't. All right, so for the final question from Lewis, he says, will Japan remain the number one in this art or can Western countries get ahead? Uh, in my opinion, I think that uh, Japan had already sort of reached the pinnacle of quality in terms of bonsai art. Uh, so I, I don't think that we can necessarily get ahead. I think we can sort of match that. And I think we're getting very close to doing that here in the States. We have some of the best Yamadori in the world, in my opinion, in our mountains in the US. It just needs to be tapped into uh, and developed over the long run. Um, but I think we're moving more towards that aesthetic. And then, you know, as Japan sort of possibly declines, at least the market in Japan declines and the availability of new material declines in Japan, yes, there will be a surpassing of Japan, at least in terms of the market. But, you know, like I said before, in my opinion, Japan has reached the pinnacle of 
bonsai art. Uh, and for the rest of us creating bonsai here in the States and in Europe, uh, there seems to be a push towards trying to strive for that type of aesthetic. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully at some point we can sort of match that and then uh, go beyond that as Japan uh, unfortunately declines going into the future. Uh, again, just in terms of sort of the, the market setup uh, as it revolves around bonsai. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Bonsai Network podcast. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. And uh, we're going to get into a whole bunch of different topics in upcoming episodes. Uh, I'm going to try to put an episode out at least once a month, if not every couple of weeks or so. I know I say that every single time, but I'm not traveling hardly as much anymore. And I should have a lot more uh, opportunity to sit down here and actually make these videos and these podcasts. Uh, until next time, though, make sure you like and subscribe uh, both to our YouTube channel and to the podcast itself. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Take care.